Hi, I'm Randy Cantrell. Welcome to the Year of the Peer podcast with Leo Batari. This podcast is based on a simple truth. Who you surround yourself with matters. Author and keynote speaker Leo Batari will interview thought leaders from all walks of life who will share how they leverage peer advantage and show you how engaging your peers more purposefully can hold the key to greater success in business and in life. Today's guest is Trent Sanderson. Trent is the owner and creator of Team Prep USA. The Team Prep USA running program provides clients the tools, knowledge, and support to take their running careers to the next level. The program's philosophy has brought national recognition and personal success to the clients. Trent has coached two Olympians, 11 national individual track and cross-country champions, 24 national high school All-Americans, and 12 NCAA All-Americans during a short stint as a college coach, including three years as head men's and women's cross-country coach at the University of Maryland. We welcome Trent to the show. Trent, welcome to the show. So happy to have you here. I got to tell you that, um, you know, with the work that you do uh, for Team Prep USA and, and driving a level of excellence among <clears throat> all of these young athletes and the way you do, I think there's so much to be learned for all of us, whether we're trying to achieve excellence in business or in entertainment or in sports or whatever that starts to look like. And I know from your perspective, it's not only about good coaching and personal dedication, but surrounding yourself with the right people in order to ensure the level of success that creates you know, Olympic athletes, for example. And maybe most of us may never know uh, that type of uh, uh, you know, achievement, but I think the lessons that um, you know, are part of what you do are extraordinary. I know I've uh, been on your website and all of the kids who participated in Team Prep USA say that it's not just about running, it's, about big, it's bigger than that. It's, it's life lessons, you know. But uh, first what I'd like our audience to do is just get to know a little bit about you, kind of how you got to where you are, maybe some of the people who have influenced you along the way, and then we'll just get into kind of how you work with your athletes and, and what that looks like. So. So awesome. it's all yours. Thanks for having me. I'm up in Mount Christie Butte at 9,400 feet, and I moved here in 04. And, you know, I was very fortunate to pick up running. And, um, you know, I grew up in a family of four, youngest of four. And I was born in Columbus, Ohio, and we moved to the middle of nowhere in Mississippi. <laughs> and I felt a little robbed, right? I felt like I wanted to go see the world and because I was the youngest and the youngest being six, eight years behind my other siblings, um, I was kind of on my own and you hear about it more often than none, but adversity, you know, really ha not quite fitting into the group you're in could also help benefit you in the future. Um, and it's ironic because what I do for a living is I work with, type A kids, very driven kids, very social gifted kids, kids that I might not have worked as a head coach at University of Maryland or assistant coach at Florida State when I coached in college. Um, and that was my choice. That was probably me being a little immature because everyone has the same opportunity. And I do, I had this idea that when you have adversity in your life, it really makes you think about where you want to go and where you want to be. And when I grew up in South Tolo, Mississippi, just north of Tupelo, I literally dreamed a lot and I thought about a lot. And I had dyslexic. I really had a hard time getting through school, barely passed, got through college, barely got through the system. I'd reached cliff notes, four cliff notes. I don't realize that exists, but it does. <laughs> but when I was when I was there though, I it was almost like someone that did read a lot. My, my dad read a lot, and I always uh, envied him of that. And I couldn't with my ADD and my attention to detail there. But when I felt like when people read, they dream more. They shape it in their mind of what it should be, right? And then I have been fortunate to meet some incredible mentors in my life, and I honestly believe that your, your perception of reality is reality, how you perceive reality every day is what reality becomes. And my mom didn't, uh, had a hard time. I don't know if she finished high school or not. We didn't talk a lot about that, but she was a house mom. 
and would always say, Trent, don't worry. She says, she realized I wasn't going to get overseas after a while. And she said, you know, the C students own the companies and the A students will get really smart and they'll learn to work for you. And that's what moms do, right? Their goal is to always be your biggest cheerleader. And it, it really helped a lot. And it made me think about that. And then now what I do now is I work with those A students and I teach them a value of a dollar. I teach them how to understand things better. I teach them how to fail better, to have balance, to take risk, to turn the paper in. Because I think a lot of type A driven people have the wrong definition of perfectionism. They think being a perfectionist is being perfect. It's about striving for excellence. And, you know, um, that's kind of shaped me. How did you get interested in running, though? Where did that all begin for you? Yeah, well, I, I tried to play football, and I, I got hurt. I had my leg put behind my back. Actually, it was this location on my hip. Wow. I just took the hospital. They said I'd never run again, and I'd always walk with a limp. And that was my junior year of high school, doing like a double reverse. And then I tried to play basketball, and I was good in middle school wasn't good in high school and and to the to the to the point a lot of runners do go out for running because they couldn't make other teams right and because running seems to accept everybody and running was kind of where it identified me and that kind of helps me make become a great life coach because I feel like um you know the kid with blue hair the kid with the nose earring you know all they're trying to do is be unique and fit in and when I had running I had felt like more of a purpose to finish high school and then as I was going through college my goal was just to stay eligible and that got me through college right um, and I think that that's what I'm real passionate about I know schools like Middlebury um, do it to a, a whole nother level now where they want you to go find their passion first or at least go find out what piques your interest before you go into your degree so sometimes if you get accepted to Middlebury they'll say look you're accepted but you're not going to come until 2018 or 2019. And oh, by the way, you want to be a director and film. I want you to go and volunteer or go get a job in Hollywood as a director or at least working on a film set. And I think it's brilliant. And that's what we're starting to do with Team Prep is shape that into mirroring for job opportunities and, and job placements. So you can go in with a bigger motivation. I know one of your questions would probably be is who were my mentors and you know the one that you probably wouldn't think would be coming up would be my brother that actually works for me now he's six years older than me and he didn't finish high school and I think there's a great story to it because he was going to night school plumbing then went and got his associates because someone that he was working lawnscaping with helped um, pay for his degree and then he ended up getting his bachelor's and then his master's. And then he worked for the state of Mississippi and the state of Colorado as a vocational rehabilitational counselor. And the neat thing about that is what I teach our kids and or at least try to help them mentor them is there's a sense that you're always feel like you might be behind and you got to get that mentality out. And that's why my brother motivated me because he started way later in life, his late thirties. And what people need to understand is there's no finish line. Mm. Um, they think that okay I need to get I need to skip a couple grades of school here I need to move on here and when they do those things what's the goal you know to have family have kids have memories have moments I get that create moments create love create passion but the problem is is I feel like people need to experience life more and they need to be able to mature more um, I know Malcolm Gladwell is which one of my mentors because I listen to a lot of books on tape he talks about NHL hockey players and about how they're all born within a certain months, three months apart. And if you look at that, he's pretty consistent with that. And why I think he is consistent with that. Sorry, something's on the thing. Why he is consistent with that is when they're born at a certain age, then they all of a sudden can get into the club sport at age six, maybe six months older. And that six months at that age is a lot more maturity, right? Mm -hmm. So in my mind, if people would go to school, maybe first grade older, they would already have a huge advantage, right? So I feel like that's why I don't understand why people race to get to the finish line, what finish line, you know? And um, then they feel like, you know, they didn't get parts of their life. So then they go off and try to feel like, you know, they want to relive those parts of their lives. And, um, you know, 
my brother was a big part of that as well. That's one of the many mentors that I had. You know, I mentioned, you know, so many of the people who go to Team Prep USA speak to the fact that there are so many great lessons pertaining to running, but also those lessons pertain to the rest of their life. What are some of the things that you think that you specifically teach when it comes to running that you also, you know, see as applicable um, any, no matter what they do? Well, it's ironic because today, uh, put it on our uh, Instagram and Facebook, today was a day that I picked this summer. We had a camp that went from four nights, nine nights, 20 nights, and 42 nights from around 160 student athletes from 42 states and seven countries. Wow. And I came up with a date to tell them that, okay, you know, the, what I want you to do on this, by this date, I want you to disassociate yourself with someone that's potentially not benefiting you and not being um, motivational for you to be able to become a better version of yourself. And it was ironic because yesterday my phone blew up, all these people from Indonesia to Shanghai to New York, <laughs> and I love it. And it, it brings tears to my eyes almost where, you know, I learned as a student athlete when I try to teach them is you become the norm of the group you hang around. And I honestly believe that. And when I first started team prep, we had a lot of kids that didn't want to be there sometimes. And then as what we want to do, and I always felt like is you want to get to that 70% of kids that are really functional, want more out of life. And then when you bring in that 30%, they can really fit in and change. If they're not, we kind of cut around the, the edges. And one thing about team prep that I think that the country doesn't do as much is it's playing benefit to the kids that are getting it right, the kids that want more out of life. Not necessarily the perfect kids, because there's no perfect kids. I mean, they might shout at their parents and might be a little bit arguable with them but to an extent when they're out there in public they're they want more they get it done in the classroom but they're always holding back and waiting on the goofball or the person that doesn't want to quite do it and at team prep we praise the kids at the top you know when someone does really well they get talked about and some kids like a Bree Oakley last summer this summer got talked about a lot and in the past Shelby Hayes got talked about a lot you know, just all of the different girls and guys, Kayla Potter off, um, you know, last year got talked about a lot. They're kids that are really making an impact. And I honestly felt like if you try to diversify yourself and talk about everyone to an extent, then all of a sudden you're doing what I feel like the country sometimes does us this disservice is they're trying to give out the same award to everybody. They're trying to make everyone feel as special as everyone else. And that's not how life works. And I honestly believe the kid that doesn't get talked about, the kid that doesn't get praised, sometimes can come out of it and just be amazing. So at our camp, they all kind of feed off of each other. And we make them understand that the life lessons that they're learning is going to be a direct effect in life. They're going to go through adversity. When they go through adversity, they're going to build more character. And I think that works extremely well. Um, they're going to learn that long-term gratification is going to give them more benefits. So example, when a kid come in or becomes a client, because I work with kids year round as well, they have a program that's sent to them on a daily basis. And there's a lot of repetitiveness. And I always joke about this, but I always say when some kid comes into our program, they go, wow, it's so simple. And I always felt like they start to realize that when they move out of that system and maybe lose it, leave it for a term, they realized how unique it was because I always felt like we do simple really well. We do simple better than everyone else. And one of the things I do a really good job at is, and I think our kids do a really good job at is paying attention to detail. I always joke because I had a lot of mental stress. I had a lot of um, opportunities where I felt like I didn't take advantage of it. And that makes you a great coach, right? Because you could preach it because you went through it. And I feel like, you know, in our situation where a lot of teenagers can look at adults and look at them as being hypocritical because they'll say one thing, but then they won't even let you do those things or at least give you the time necessary to do them. And what I found is in our program, we do do that. 
we have parents that try, unfortunately, um, sometimes to live through their kids, and we want them to have the same goals and passions. We have parents sometimes that have done amazing things, that have founded restaurants, that are CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies, and they want their kid to not take the same risk. And I tell the kids at camp, shame on them for doing that. I want you to take your own path. I mean, years ago, I'm in Sarasota meeting with a family, and they're telling me about his um, life, the father, and how he got fire, fired as a line cook here, and he got fired here, and he got he was here, and then he moved here, and he wanted his kid to go to this Ivy League school and not take the risk. And I said, you understand, that's why you got to where you were at, because you did go down that path. You had that unique path that allowed you to become a highly successful restaurant mm. owner of a many chains. Mm. And he listened, and what, what I found is now this young uh, student athlete in college is at maybe not an Ivy League school, but at a school where he feels empowered, where he feels like he's making an impact on a day to day basis. And, um, you know, I, I felt like at an early age that you learn very early that you get influenced by the people around you, like your parents, their job is to influence you and that they, they do the best they can. Right. And then as you grow up, you start becoming influenced by more people that catch your interest, right? So really, you're not even knowing who you are yet. And the other thing that irks me a little bit, and we joke about it at our camp, is you hear songs. I mean, as you know, teenagers use every, use every listen to every genre of music now. But like the song Jack and Diane by John Mellencamp. You know, it talks about holding on to 16 as long as you can. And I think we're doing a disservice because we're telling our kids that you know, when you get out of high school, life is over. Mm -hmm. And that is the furthest from the truth. And the people that I feel like feel that way sometimes have a harder next 30 years of their life. I mean, you hear it in country songs, you hear it in all these things. And I honestly believe that if you ask an adult, if they could go back in time at any age to start over, where would it be? A majority of parents, not all of them, but the majority would say maybe 26, 27, but never a teenager. Being a teenager is extremely hard. I mean, they're trying to fit in. They're trying to be someone they're not. They're trying to be popular, and they don't even realize being popular is not even going to allow them to figure out where they want to be. And because mm -hmm. if they're into the natural grind of everything and it's flowing easily, they're not even thinking about what they want out of life or who they want to be. You know, I think you'd, two points about adversity that I think are really uh, important. One is the more adversity we face, the greater the tools, you know, we have to, to really deal with life. You know, one of the things I remember reading years ago was Herbert Hoover struggled so much as president through the Great Depression because prior to him going to the White House, he never really experienced a lot of adversity in life. A lot of things went his way. All of a sudden, so you can only imagine you're president of the United States and the economy takes a dive. <laughs> what do you do? I mean, you, you just... Uh, you know, ill-equipped to kind of to kind of deal with that. Oftentimes, you know, I was in um, Bordeaux recently and had this wonderful lecture just talking about the vines in the vineyards and how oftentimes during very adverse weather conditions they say, "Well, what do you do? How do you help them?" And they go, "We don't." They said the more that the vines have to weather that storm, if you will, it builds character in the vines and actually makes for better grapes, which I thought yeah. was really kind of a really cool. Uh, you know, metaphor for all this. But the other thing I would imagine too, when I think about adversity, I don't, it doesn't strike me that your camp would be the easiest camp in the whole world. I think this is probably some tough days for these kids. So I would imagine that they're all experiencing the same thing. Coaches go away and these athletes at some level have to come together and kind of help each other through tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. So how, how do you see that in terms of the way they bond and the way they help each other through tough circumstances. Yeah. You know, so I have about 25 kids that I'm talking on a weekly basis now. And it's funny. I have parents that call me, uh, I had a parent call me two days ago, not a, not a client, but a camper and said, look, you know, my, my kid's been sleeping mm -hmm. for two weeks. Should I be concerned? <laughs> and I, said, I said, I said, I said, I will tell you, we took them through a very difficult situation. And what I, I feel like is everyone takes pride in doing something that they didn't think that they could necessarily get through. Right. And at the start of camp, I tell everyone to an extent, you know, there'll probably be 30 or 40% of the kids minimally that will shed tears at our camp. And I think that's a, not a bad thing. 
I want them to realize those perfectionists that we talked about before, the ones that the society is actually saying now that will fail. I mean, Ivy League schools now are shaking their heads and scratching their heads going, how do we get to Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates? Because those kids don't go to the Ivy League schools. Those kids don't even finish sometimes. And I think you should finish your education. I think you should always finish everything you start. But I think you need to be able to think a little outside the box. And at the camp, we do think a little outside of the box. And we have a lot of strong regimen. I mean, we had a kid this year. And it, it was his parents were supportive of this because they actually wanted to do this. So it wasn't, I don't want people to think about our camp as like this, but they actually, it was their idea. So during post camp, because he kept doing things that just keep breaking the rules just a little bit, he went and had to sleep in a tent for three days <laughs> on his parents' new property that they're building. They want to do it. They want him to do construction, but they also knew that I, he was going to have to fly home. Just enough to break the rules. It wasn't breaking the rules difficult, but like five minutes late or a minute late. And he got through those three days. And then I went back to my group and I said, my group being the camp, the post camp clients, do we want him back in? Do you guys want him back in? And they had to really concern and think about that. And when I told the gentleman that got in trouble, I said, look, this is your situation. You need to create the environment you're in and you need to be able to allow them to want to support you. Because if that ever happened, you should have these kids cheering for you to come back in. Right. Because if not, any situation you're going to go in, you're going to create that environment. As you know, you can go down. There's nothing wrong with that. But you can go down to the local trailer park, and you can hear and listen to a lot of pissed off people. And you'll find that what I like about this is we're not talking about money. We're talking about attitudes. And he didn't have those right attitudes. And it's ironic because next fall – this coming fall, actually, I think he left this week or next week, he's going to Harvard University. So it doesn't matter what package you're wrapped in, you know, but at the same time, he needed to understand that and learn that. And at camp, you know, what we do is we take kids to places that are extremely difficult, not injury, but difficult, and we allow them to adapt to it. You know, we had a young girl this year, the last two years, named Bree Oakley, and I was very fortunate for her to come into my life. And the first thing I was talking about to her dad when I started working with her is I said, I needed to take her to a point of breaking to be able to get her confidence because she knew what got her there. That's the other problem that most people see when they're working with athletes that they don't understand is they want to change everything. They say, no, you should do this. You should do this. But you got to remember the kid, the teenager already thinks, Adults are hypocritical. <laughs> so they're thinking, you know, this is what got me there. So why wouldn't I keep doing it? So what you need, what I need to always tell them is I said, what typically got you there won't always necessarily keep you there. So I took her to a point of breaking to where all of a sudden we can push her real hard then to have easier days so we can absorb things and work smarter, not harder. And then what we did and what we do at camp and what we do as clients is we have certain structured systems that put them in that to take them to positions that are very difficult. And then they linger in those situations. And you'll find that that creates their life in general because what it allows them to do is learning and, and distance learning and football and, and law school and, and all these different aspects of life. It's about outlasting people. And what a dyslexic person understands is he's just going to sit around and collect the crumbs, so to speak, right? And then eventually he will get his job, right? Because if he stays around long enough. But I always felt like, what if you can get an A-plus student, second in their class, first in their class, top of the list as an athlete, and teach them how to be a seventh on the team, a walk-on that's crawling to make the team. Then you have an Olympian. Then you have someone special. And, you know, I had that conversation with Bree Oakley, and I let her know. I said, you know, if you could be the walk-on trying to make the team, brilliant things will happen. No, there's no doubt she has an extreme amount of talent. And a coach is nothing but a mirror that sees those things and brings those things out in them and allows them to come to their own conclusions, right? And as you know, you could be your worst enemy, too, because you can always train too hard or be in a recovery state too often. And those are some of the things that we did. And the thing that really got me passionate about what I do is running in general. I could not make the ACT score for even being NCAA eligible. 
And I'll say that now, and I don't feel bad at all that because most of my clients are 31 and above on the ACT out of 36. <laughs> and I, it's ironic because I only made a 17. And you have to make an 18 to be NCAA required unless you go to a jun junior college. So I went to a junior college called Wallace State just north of Birmingham, Alabama. And I've had three or four girls and guys out of Mount Brook. If you know that area, it's a very, um, very fluential area of Birmingham and probably one of the most fluential areas of, of Alabama. And if you ask any of those kids at Mount Brook where Wallace State is, they had no clue. And it's only 35 miles away in Coleman, Hansville, Alabama. And it's funny because they, no, they have no opportunity or idea of that environment. And I went there. And I got better. And then I transferred to Southwestern Michigan. And when I transferred up there, I ended up rooming with a 910 Chris Harvey guy. Pete Hess ran 905. And I ran a 1007 in high school. And what I did is I started working real hard and had an opportunity to get on a flight to nationals. I never had been on a plane. All my kids have been on planes. Some even have private planes. And that was a motivation for me. So I tell our kids at camp they should find – meaning in what they do why are they doing the gold medal on their neck the approval of the crowd the smell the, the the fresh cut grass that you smell before a soccer game or soccer match or running just brings back memories smells do that and then all of a sudden you know i'm in this situation and i got better the coach told me we're not going to nationals because, well, he only wants to take three and i made four and he said i had to be the top five i was furiated at this guy and he was my fuel for a long year, a lot of years. And he's friends with me on Facebook now. And you'll probably hear this. And he said, we're not going. And this is before the movie Rudy came out. And Chris Harvey, Pete Hess all turned their jerseys in and said, we're not going. Because they're my roommates. And they said, fine, we won't go at all. So guess what? Like I said, it's not a movie. They went back and took their jersey back. <laughs> and I drove them to, Nash, uh, to the airport and watched them fly away. And I was not happy. And I worked harder. Mm -hmm. And I got hard enough to where I got a really nice scholarship. And then I went off to the University of New Orleans and I got a full ride to the University of New Orleans. And then what I started realizing is the people you hang around, because when I'm transferred to Southwestern Michigan, I got better. It was hard, but I got better. I probably trained harder than I should because I had to, because they were just so much better. So then I didn't race well because I was so tired, right? So then I had to learn recovery steps that I taught teach my kids. Kids that that really bought into what I do as an athlete and things that I've changed over the years. And then when I went off and started, I, I tried to run professionally. I moved to Boulder in 1996, got sponsored by Snapple and I got injured all the time. So then I got into sales and I realized I want to go hang around people that are positive and good. So I got into multi-level marketing. The company I got into eventually um, got um, let go from the, from what um, the business bureau because I had some issues. But until then, I, I saved up enough money. I moved out. I didn't go. I went out for a weekend to one of those motivational things with the company in Beverly Hills. Didn't even have a place to stay. But I learned that I just keep putting myself around that mm. environment. And then I made a bunch of money at it, moved to Mississippi, opened an environmental company. Guess what? It's hard to open up an environmental company in Mississippi. <laughs> And, and within a year, we lost all the money. My dad, my mom worked for me. My dad thought it was nuts, but I did it. But my dad also was a great mentor to me as well, believe it or not. And he was always real grounded. My mom taught me to dream a lot. But, when then I, but the biggest thing I wanted to get across is when I failed at that, I realized what running did for me, how you become the norm of the group you hang around. So I moved to Aspen, Colorado on a whim. And my, go my goal was to strategically get a job at the Aspen Institute, Aspen Meadows, which I thought was the think tank of the world, which I did, a front desk job. And then I got a nice security job at the Hotel Jerome and the Ritz-Carlton, which I think is the St. Regis at the time. And what I did is my goal was to hang around successful people. And I met this gentleman named Paul J. Meyer that passed away about five years ago. And he shaped my life. He really talked about doing some of the opposites of what people tell you to do. Because he said, if you do what everyone tells you to do, you'll get what everyone expects you to get. And he keep telling me, what do I want to do in life? And I keep said, I'd love to do what you're doing. You know, I mean, I didn't know what he was doing, but I know he was a billionaire and he had houses all over the world. 
And you've heard the whole thing about teach someone to fish instead of give you a fish. Mm -hmm. He really did that. He invited me to Bubba, Bubba's garage in Snowmass Village. I lived across from Chevy Chase and Neil Diamond at the time. I lived above a garage. It was pretty nice. And um, I took him up Mount Albert, Albert, the highest point in Colorado, highest mountain, uh, on his 80th birthday. But he told me to figure out what I love to do. And I really thought and searched about what made me sit and stand a little taller. And I gave someone some running advice once. And I remembered how it made me feel better. And it was really me just trying to connect with a friend. And then when I found out it helped her, it motivated me a lot. And it was a girl, actually kind of liked, you know, <laughs> and it was Beth and found out from there. I told Mr. Meyer, he says, well, go do that. He said, there's no money in that. He said, look, and you hear this in podcast or, you know, things that you're doing all the time, but he did this before. I felt like no one was talking about this, but he said, if you do something passionately and do it like you're treating cancer, people eventually acquire attention and want to be served in that environment or coached or whatever if you can create passion because people are buying into my excitement about what I do and I am excited and I'm very passionate and sold on what I'm doing so I ended up getting a job at, at Glenwood Springs and I moved right up the ladder and in three years we had several national champions top three um, one two and three and the two and the one and 1997 1998 and then I had an opportunity interviewed at Stanford Georgetown, Arkansas, Florida State. But then when I went to FSU, because I got a role to play, Terry Long there, when I got there, he wasn't even thinking I probably would have showed up. But I will say once I got there, I know he was being hard like he should be, but he gave me an opportunity. He gave me a group that no one wanted to run work with that they wanted me to run off. They gave me a group that basically was walk-ons. And what I remember when Mr. Meyer told me, and this is what I teach your kids, is if I do what they tell me to exactly do, I would eventually be in a, a circle for a while and a volunteer and move up and then move around and then in five or six years be a head coach at a maybe a small tier Division two, and then move up maybe to Division two head coach and then eventually maybe be Division one 15, 20 years down the road. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to take the kids that they got, instead of running them off, I wanted to figure out how I can get in their heads and make them feel special. And I did that. And a young girl named Laura Gerber uh, that lives in Cape Town, South Africa now, she ended up becoming, in one year, the fastest runner that FSU ever had in the history at FSU. And then another guy, Jennings, which literally had a lot of, a lot of issues – um, he became one of the best runners that FSU ever had. So within a year, I got to become head coach at the University of Maryland. And then I realized all this stuff Mr. Meyer was telling me, I can use in every part of my life. So then when I learned to snowboard, my, and instead of stressing about failing, I came to the conclusion that I should fall down 100 times because then I wasn't stressed about failing. So that's what I do. I mean, I don't become a hypocrite. I try to actually use the, some of the things that I teach to my kids, and then I go out and try to also keep applying them so I feel like I'm a student of the game. And then when I was at Maryland, I realized that I can go and control my own destiny because I had a girl, young girl named Allison Carney. And to this day, I still feel bad about you know everything um, to an extent that happened there because I love that group that I was with. and. Um, I moved on, and I um, this girl, Allison Carney, before I moved on, said, are you following your goals? Are you following your dreams? I mean, because we met late at night at the Comcast Center. I mean, not your typical coach. I took it to another level. But when she told me that, she had a point. that you know, every, every summer, I tell our kids that all the kids that I work with have less than 70 summers. That's fair to say, right? They're all 16, 15 years of age. To an extent, they probably have a less than 70 summers. And some of the kids, believe it or not, have spent seven summers with us. And you think about that, wow, I want them to value their time. And what I also tell them at camp, and I learned, you know, when I was at Maryland every place, that the whole goal in life is to have time. And if you could potentially make more money, you could trade money for time. You could have too much money and no time, or you can have too much time and no money. Um, you know, and I think that that's – 
there's there's something to be said about that. So I went off to and came here in '04 with the in in mind and idea is to create this program. And Leo, you said something when I first met you that I think the program hasn't really even hit yet is is a network. A college is nothing but a network. Why can't team prep be a network? Meaning I would love for them to come back and talk about what they've become, their experiences. And it's like I tell our kids we don't have any kind of religion in part of our team prep. But in my mind, what we're talking about and preaching is kind of like someone's faith. And as you get strong with it, you go out into the real world, you can get badgered, you can get put down, you can get knocked around, and you can eventually um, get kind of back into the norm and the negativity, and you have to come back and get recharged. And one thing I really want to share with you is I had a young girl named Emily, and she was out of Cypress Bay, Florida. And when I was working with her, she was someone I would, at the time when I moved here, there was an academy and I was luring her or luring anyone to come. So I'd give coaching advice and some stuff we would do in a structured environment. And it was working extremely well, Leo. And she said, well, if it's working so well, why do I need to come to the academy, right? So I kind of shot myself in the foot. So then she said, name a price. And that's kind of how my goal is to come up with a certain price for them, me to work with them. But here's the coolest thing, Leo, and I love this because this girl had a success story in life. And some people say, well, she just didn't do anything great maybe out of college or at the end of her college career. But, see, team prep is not about that. It's about becoming successful in whatever you want to do. We've had counselors quit running sometimes when they come to our program because we have campfires and we talk about life and what they want and how whatever they're around and influenced around is going to change them. So literally they need to make themselves kind of in irreplaceable in their jobs. They need to work hard and keep all their options open to an extent. And when I was working with her, she calls me up one day, two years, literally her senior year, she already confirmed on her college. She's crying. You know how when someone talks, they're like, you know, and I'm like, what's wrong? And she goes, well, I've been running on a treadmill for you and I've been running this pace and someone came up to me the other day and said, I really wasn't running that pace. And I said, okay. I said, so what's your question? Well, what was I running that pace? And I said, no, you weren't. And I said, and she starts really crying now. Right. And I said, but what's the problem? She goes, well, I've been running 615 pace and now you're telling me I wasn't. So everything I've been doing has been a lie. And I said, yeah, but what's, what's the problem? He said, well, I just told you the problem. And I said, yeah, but you, your objective when you started working with me was to run fast. She goes, yes. I said, okay, when you go outside, you run your long runs at 615 pace. Is that correct? Yes. You made it to Foot Locker Nationals twice, right? Yes. You're going to Stanford University on a full ride scholarship <laughs> to running. Is that correct? Yes. What's the problem again? And she said, but, but, but I said, here's the problem. Someone told you that something's not working and that's why you're believing in that. The problem is, is you're right. Running on a treadmill throws you forward and you run faster than you really can run than you could out on the surface. But guess what? It accomplished the objectives. It's about what you perceive it to be. So all of a sudden someone says something's not working and putting you down. You obviously start believing that. And that's what my mom said. You know, there's going to be a lot of naysayers. That's what Paul J. Meyer told me. He says, as soon as you start making it to the top, there's going to be people putting you down. And you know that if you're making it to the top, then there, if there are people putting you down, then there's people that have a hard time understanding. And they don't need to understand. You know, what you want to do is surround yourself with people that support you, that make you want to be a better version of yourself. And, you know, those are the kind of concepts that we talk about at our camp and our program throughout the year. You know, another thing that's really helped shape my life is the parents of the kids that I work with. You know, they are quite successful. It's ironic how the people that have seeked me out just keep seeking me out. And they're, they're, they're very influential type people. I work with all kinds of people. I work more with those influential situations. And what, what do I do? I learn from them situations. I feel like there's always a product. There's an, always an opportunity. But the biggest thing is I do think success can skip generations. And I think that even if you have a head start, 
meaning that you can get into the right schools. You probably might not have to worry about a college um, deficit. That could work against you, right? You got to value it. So our camps, you know, kids, you know, we always tell our kid parents, let the kids pay for it. They have to value it. No, I think that's great. You know, um, I, I can't tell you, first of all, all of the things you've shared was everything I would hope that would come forward in this show in terms of all of the life lessons and all. Uh, also, last year, one of the first um, speaking gigs that I did uh, after the Power of Peers book came out was in Paul Corona's class at, um, uh, at, at Kellogg. Uh, you know, at Northwestern. And he wrote the book that you and I have talked about called The Wisdom of Walk-Ons. And of course, Bobby Bowden wrote the forward, and it was this idea of that walk-on mentality and how powerful it is. And I think what has been great to have you share is if you can surround yourself with the right people and have that walk-on mentality and, and really persevere and really outlast in many respects, um, there isn't anything that, that that we can't do and be successful at. So, but before we run, I do want to give um, everyone a sense of how do they learn more about Team Prep USA or, or um, and if you could kind of give some information about where they can find uh, you and Team Prep USA on, on the web, that would be great. So tell us that. Yeah, it's, it's just Team Prep USA running or Team Prep USA. You can Google it. Uh, we have a YouTube page. We have a website. Um, and, you know, my big thing is love to people to learn everyone's story. And they can find us on the web there. Um, we have a camp in the summer that goes from four nights, nine nights, 20 nights. And if you're a client, you have an opportunity, maybe 42 nights. We <laughs> have a winter camp up in, um, in t down in Tampa, Florida. We bring in New Year's at Bush Gardens. And, uh, you know, we're always looking for great mentors um, that might want to speak at our camps. Um, I'm very careful of who I put in front of our kids. Um, I will say I'm very motivated when I have kids that have adversity in your life. We had a young girl that was dyslexic and was homeschooled and got made fun of a lot and ended up graduating from Harvard again. Um, you know, and then I love people that have a story. And, um, you know, we, we are very fortunate to be able to run into you. I think that, you know, we have a mutual friend that connected us. And I think that um, I think that if you're open, you know, things happen in your life. You know, I had a CEO once tell me years ago that if on his job interview, his question was, are you lucky? And when you fill out that job like application, if you mark no, there's a good, good consideration that they probably won't hire you because successful people feel like they have a sense of luck. And I teach our kids, we talk about luck is labor under consistent or labor under correct knowledge. I'm sure you've heard of that. And I honestly believe that you do create your luck. And I do think that you put yourself in situations for opportunities to happen. And I know when I first met you, I, I obviously felt like that was an opportunity. And each year we have different themes. I have a boat on the East Coast called The Relentless. One of our themes two years ago was opportunity or obligation. And most people don't understand that, but every day you have an opportunity or you have a, give it away, but you have a situation where you can look at someone, something as an opportunity or an obligation. And if you go to our team prep Facebook page or my personal page, Trent Lawson Sanderson, you'll see we run up these runs that are pretty brutal later on in camp. And every one of our kids honestly look at it as a privilege. They look at it as a privilege doing difficult things and adapting to them. And I honestly believe that we do live in the greatest country on earth. And to live here, but still sometimes go into a situation where you can have a, a little consideration or an idea of what it would be like to be in a third world country gives you a great opportunity. You know, I tell our kids every year when they finish camp, they're going to respect the couch. Like, wow, this is a soft couch, a glass of water that doesn't need to be purified. I told you later before this, I get to go out to an outdoor concert tonight. And, you know, I always make sure I get a perspective. I, you're, you know, before we had this I, podcast, I was talking to you last week at a get together about me going on that fishing boat in Dutch Harbor in the Lucian Islands. And I got on that boat 
in literally three days where most people it would take almost two years to be able to get on a boat that fast into Bering Sea. And I did that honestly from my mom as a mentor, my dad as a mentor, and you know, Paul J. Meyer. Do some of the opposites of what people tell you to do. Be relentless. Look deeper into the situation. And then all of a sudden, you'd be surprised what you can get. That's what dyslexic students have to do, right? They have to look around the system. I read a book once about dyslexia, and they talked about, and I listened to it on tape, about how people would find out ways to get around the system. And when I would create those study groups and buy the pizza for everyone, I didn't even realize it, but I was creating a business aspect. I was creating how to network with people. And a straight A student, in my mind, can do that as well, but sometimes they're so good at photographic memory and regurgitating things and spitting it back out, you really have a hard time really creating passion about what you did because when you go through something that's so freaking difficult it keeps you so devoted and that's why when our kids leave this camp you know we've joked about it we've had parents go man my kid will not shut up about camp (laughs) and usually my kid doesn't want anything but they won't shut up about it and it's because we take things to a level that other people have a hard time grasping and we do it in a very controlled environment. And we have a lot of fun. I teach our kids to play hard and work hard. You should be able to have a balance. You know, if they don't have a balance, they're going to blow up. No, I think that's, uh, again, uh, you know, amazing uh, takeaways, I think, for everyone here today. just want to thank you so much for being on the show. I know I feel lucky for having met you. I think our audience is lucky for getting to hear everything you, you've talked about today. And uh, just uh, thanks so much and have a great day, okay? Thank you so much, Lou. Thanks for joining us today. To learn more about Peer Advantage, to submit questions to Leo and our guest, and to subscribe to the Year of the Peer podcast, please visit us at leobatari.com. It's L-E-O-B-O-T-T-A-R-Y.com. This podcast is produced by me, Randy Kentra, hosted, of course, by Leo Batari. Music provided by Kevin McLeod, Vibe Ace, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 license.